So, what are the clinical manifestations of amyotrophic lateral sclerosis? So, the manifestations of amyotrophic lateral sclerosis are somewhat variable depending on whether uh, corticospinal neurons or lower motor neurons in the brainstem and spinal cord are more prominently involved. So, the manifestations will vary whether upper motor neurons or lower motor neurons whether involvement of upper motor neurons in the uh, brain stem or spinal cord or lower motor neurons or so depending on which motor neurons whether in brain stem or spine brain stem or spinal cord the manifestations will vary with lower motor neuron dysfunction so if there is a lower motor neuron dysfunction and if there is early uh, denervation what is the first evidence of the disease? The first evidence of the disease is insidiously developing asymmetric weakness. So this asymmetric weakness, it is first evident distally in one of the limbs with lower motor neuron dysfunction. And if there is early denervation, what will happen? What is the first evidence of the disease? It is asymmetric weakness. So this is usually first evident distally in one of the limbs. So if you take a detailed history, what will happen? So this will disclose a uh, history which has a cramping with volitional movements. So what will be there? Cramping with volitional movements. So this cramping, this occurs in early hours of the morning that is while stretching in the bed. So this cramping occurs in the early hours of the morning while stretching in the bed. So weakness caused by this denervation, it is associated. So denervation occurs, so this is associated with progressive wasting and atrophy of the muscles. And particularly early in the illness, spontaneous twitching of motor units or fasciculations will be there. So there is a denervation. Uh, weakness will be caused by denervation. So this is associated with there will be wasting and atrophy of the muscles, amyotrophy as discussed earlier. And particularly early in the illness, what will happen? There will be a spontaneous twitching of motor units or there will be fasciculations. So early cramping will be there, fasciculations will be there. In the hands, a preponderance of extensor over flexor weakness is common. So what is common in the hands? A preponderance of extensor over flexor weakness is common. So if the initial denervation involves bulbar rather than limb muscles, instead of uh, limb muscles, if the initial denervation, if it involves bulbar muscles, what is the problem at onset? So there will be a difficulty with shaving, there will be difficulty with swallowing and uh, movements of the difficulty in the movements of the face and tongue. So, when the initial denervation, it involves bulbar rather than limb muscles, there will be difficulty with shivering, difficulty with swallowing and difficulty in the movements of the face and tongue. So, rarely early involvement of the muscles of respiration may lead to death. So, sometimes what happens before the disease progresses, what will happen? There will be early involvement of the muscles of the respiration. So with prominent corticospinal involvement, supposing if there is a predominant upper motor neuron involvement, what will happen? So in upper motor neuron involvement, there will be hyperactivity of the muscle stretch reflexes. That is jerks, tendon jerks will be hyperactive and there will be hypertonia will be there. That is spastic resistance to passive movements of the affected limbs. If we move the limbs passively, there will be spastic resistance. So tone will be increased and reflexes will be exacerbated. Patients with significant reflex hyperactivity, they complain of muscle stiffness. So in upper motor neuron type, what will happen? Patients will complain of muscle stiffness out of proportion to the weakness. So there will be uh, muscle stiffness which is out of proportion to the weakness. 
so degeneration of the cortico bulbar projections innervating the brain stem so if there is a degeneration of the cortico bulbar projections which are innervating the brain stem so this results in dysarthria and exaggeration of the motor expressions of emotions so degeneration of the cortico bulbar projections innervating the brain stem so this will result in dysarthria and there will be exaggeration of the motor expressions of emotion so the later leads to see motor expressions of emotion means so there will be a involuntary excess in weeping or laughing so this is called as pseudo bulbar effect involuntarily there will be excess weeping and there will be excess laughing so this is called a pseudo bulbar effect virtually any muscle group may be the first to show signs of disease any muscle group can show the signs of disease but as time passes what will happen more and more muscles become involved and ultimately the disorder will take on a symmetric di distribution in all the regions initially it is asymmetrical later what happens more and more muscles become involved and the disorder becomes symmetric in distribution so it is characteristic of als that regardless of the whether initial disease involves upper or lower motor neurons both eventually both will eventually be implicated so initially either it could be upper motor or lower motor so finally what will happen it both will be uh, eventually be implicated even in the late stages of the disease though there is a advancement of the disease that is in the late stages what is preserved sensory bowel bladder and cognitive functions are preserved that is only motor involvement is seen but there is no sensory involvement bowel bladder and cognitive functions are preserved even uh, when there is a severe brain stem disease even when there is severe brain stem disease ocular motility is spared until the very late stages of the disease though there is a brain stem involvement but what happens the ocular motility is spared until the late very late stages of the disease as noted in some cases uh particularly those that are familial if we take familial als so in familial als ALS develops concurrently with frontotemporal dementia so as noted in some cases particularly those that are familial so this ALS it develops concurrently with frontotemporal dementia so this frontotemporal dementia it is characterized by early behavioral abnormalities frontotemporal dementia characterized by early behavioral abnormalities with prominent behavioral features indicative of frontal lobe dysfunction be if there is a frontal lobe involvement so what will happen there will be prominent behavioral features that is behavioral abnormalities will be there in frontotemporal dementia so this is most commonly seen with familial type of als a committee of the world federation of neurology has established diagnostic guidelines so the diagnostic guidelines are established by world federation of neurology so essential for the diagnosis so for the diagnosis what should be present there should be a simultaneous upper and lower motor neuron involvement with progressive weakness and exclusion of all alternative diagnosis so in this what should be there there should be simultaneous upper and lower motor neuron involvement should be there uh, there should be a progressive weakness and exclusion of all alternative diagnosis so the disorder is ranked as definitive als when three or four of the following are involved when to say definitive three or four of the following should be involved like bulbar cervical thoracic and lumbosacral motor neurons three or four should be involved when two sides are involved it is probable and when only one side is implicated the diagnosis is possible so two sides are involved it is probable only one side it is possible 
and but an exception is made for those who have progressive upper and lower motor neuron sites at only site but if there is a mutation uh, in the gene encoding superoxide dismutase so if there is any mutation in the gene encoding superoxide mutation so then that is also a definitive diagnosis one site it is possible diagnosis so it is now recognized that another clinical manifestation uh, in most cases of ALS is the uh, what is another clinical manifestation presence in cerebrospinal fluid of markers of neurodegeneration so in the cerebrospinal fluid there will be markers of neurodegeneration so what are these uh, elevated levels of neurofilament light chains or phosphorylated neurofilament heavy chains so what should be there in the CSF uh, in the cerebrospinal fluid there should be markers of neuro de neurodegeneration so what are the markers of neurodegeneration elevated levels of neurofilament light chains or phosphorylated neurofilament heavy chains and some markers of inflammation like monocyte chemo attractant protein 1 are also elevated and some markers of inflammation like monocyte chemo attractant protein 1 are also elevated so these csf biomarkers are increasingly used as endpoints in clinical trials epidemiology the illness is uh, relentlessly progressive so this will lead to death from re respiratory paralysis median survival is three to five years so this is a relentlessly progressive disease so ultimately death will occur from respiratory paralysis and median survival is three to five years so most societies instance is one to three per one lakh and uh, Several endemic foci of higher uh, prevalence exist in the Western Pacific and uh, men are somewhat more frequently affected than women and what are the incriminated risk factors for this disease? This includes exposure to pesticides and insecticides, silica, smoking and possibly service in the military. So what are the incriminated risk factors? Exposure to pesticides and insecticides, silica, smoking and service in the military. So although ALS is overwhelmingly a sporadic disorder, but 10% of the cases know they are inherited as an autosomal dominant right. Although ALS is overwhelmingly a sporadic disorder, but some 10% of the cases they are inherited as an autosomal dominant trait.